Okay, so hello everyone. My name is uh, Cédric Collat and I'm a new PhD student at the Flowers team in, uh, in Bordeaux. So I'm interested in exploration methods and how they could be combined to reinforcement learning algorithms, especially in high dimensional uh, states and uh, action spaces. So today I'll present uh, the work I've conducted in the past month uh, in collaboration with Olivier Sigo. Um, so the general idea is to combine an efficient exploration method. So in this case, it's going to be uh, the gold exploration process we just saw with Sebastian. Uh, to a state-of-the-art uh, reinforcement learning algorithm. So in this case, in this case uh, deep deterministic policy gradients, or DDPG. So the combination is called uh, JPG, and uh, we will uh, test it against uh, its constitutive parts, so JEP and DDPG, uh, in two environments from the OpenAI uh, GIM framework. So if you have any question, uh, in the meantime, just interrupt. So, um, I'll just remove this. Okay. okay. So you won't see the titles. <laughs> Okay, so we are concerned here with uh, policy search. Uh, so it's uh, how to find efficient policies to solve uh, continual control tasks. So uh, in the same diagrams again. Uh, so there is an agent that is um, ends out with a controller here. Um, so the parameters of this controller are what we call the, the policy. Um, so thanks to this controller, we will be able to output output uh, motor actions on the environment. Uh, so it will modify the environment and in turn it will, uh, the environment will produce um, sensory uh, feedbacks. So we, these are states or rewards. So here states means observations basically. Um, so we loop uh, around this. Um, and so, so policy search is about finding uh, the policy that will uh, maximize a certain uh, function of utility. So usually it's uh, the discounted sum of rewards over the course of a rollout or episode. So to do that, we need a learning algorithm, something that will uh, take into account the history of uh, past motor actions, states, rewards, and will produce uh, the next policy, basically, the next policy to try in the environment. And we hope by after some iterations, we converge towards a good policy. So the simplest algorithm we can think of is the random policy search. We simply uh, draw controller parameters inside a controller parameter space. Uh, then we try uh, the corresponding policies uh, in the environments and we get a utility. So we can call it a performance, so the sum of rewards over the episode. So this algorithm will basically uh, store all the pairs of uh, policies and performance in memory. And we want to try uh, to test this algorithm uh, afterwards. We simply uh, retrieve in memory uh, the policy associated to the, the highest performance and we test it in the environment. So for, for instance, 10 times we average the returns and this is our estimation of how good this policy is. So of course, uh, researchers have come up with uh, more sophisticated ideas. Uh, so Olivier presented uh, the deep aisle uh, part yesterday. So these are considered uh, state of the art for policy search in uh, high dimensional uh, states and action spaces so far. Uh, although there is a new uh, field called uh, deep new evolution uh, that basically adapts uh, evolutionary strategies to deep neural networks and that currently achieves uh, similar results. So you can see uh, various rev reviews of uh, all these algorithms. So today I'll focus on uh, deep deterministic policy gradient, or DTPG. So it's an actor critic of policy algorithm that makes use of a experience replay buffer. So I'll detail those different terms. It's gonna take one slide, so it's much shorter than yesterday. <laughs> 
I hope it will be clear enough. Uh, so after each step in the environment, the algorithm will save uh, the corresponding sample. So a sample is uh, the previous state, the action taken in that state, then the consecutive state, and the reward. So all these are saved in the experience replay buffer of the DPG. After a few steps in the environment, uh, we randomly sample a batch from this experience state, uh, experience replay buffer, and we use it basically to train the algorithm to update the policy and the, the critic. So um, the first thing to do is to um, compute an approximation of the utility function, so the mapping uh, between the state action space and utility. So it's basically the value of performing a given action in a given state. So to approximate this, uh, we use a deep neural network that is called the critic, and that is basically trained uh, using backpropagation on the samples from the experience replay buffer. Um, so then there is a second uh, deep neural network called the actor that actually implements uh, the policy. So implements the mapping between what is the previous state and what will be the next action. So overall, uh, DDPG is gradient-based method. Uh, it performs with an S, uh, an estimate um, of the gradient performance, and then use this uh, estimate to update the policy uh, towards better policies, basically. So why do we need uh, exploration? Uh, so as all gradient-based uh, method, uh, the DPG can suffer from uh, this initial condition, so the initial values of the controller parameters. It can also uh, suffer from situation where uh, the gradient is uh, flat or deceptive. So if we take a concrete case, uh, we can consider uh, the continuous mountain car problem in which the underpowered car has to uh, reach the top of the hill to get a positive uh, reward, a strong one. So um, at this time step, it receives a small negative penalty. Again, like the square should be out. Uh, so a small penalty for energy expenses. So, so you cannot just uh, go forward and reach the top, it has to swing like this. And the idea is that until it has reached uh, the top for the first time, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't have any information to, uh, for the gradient estimation, so it doesn't know in which direction to update the policy so that it reaches the top. So the only uh, reward information it has is about the small penalty. So basically the gradient will point towards the, the policy of no action because every little action will be worse, basically. So this is the case, the case of deceptive gradient in which the gradient points towards a local optimum and not the global one. So the DPG, the DPG uh, usually explores um, with action perturbations so after the controller, we have the, the actions, and uh, usually we add some Gaussian noise or more advanced uh, Armstein Uhlenbeck noise um, to these actions. And we hope by doing so that to get a bit further away from uh, the current policy, and therefore to get a um, bit, bit more uh, samples to help the, the estimation of the gradients. Um, so there is another thing that has been tried, is uh, to do parameter perturbations. So it's in this paper by Matthias Plepert. Um, so they show that they could improve on uh, locomotion tasks uh, from the OpenAI team uh, framework as well, um, by directly perturbing uh, the per parameters instead of the actions. So I think uh, in one of the review of Olivier, uh, he made a point that this was in general uh, more efficient to do this kind of perturbations that are directly on the actions. Uh, so in both cases, we, I mean, doing per parameter perturbations is also a bit what is done in evolutionary strategies, in which, like in some of the algorithms at, at least, um, the children, so the next generation, is obtained by somehow sampling with more or less noise for more or less exploration. Uh, around the mean policy of the best performing parents. So we have the parent generation, 
We take the best, we compute the mean policy, and then we sample around it for, to obtain the, the children uh, um, generation. So in those cases, the, the idea is the same, is to obtain um, more samples, so as to basically have a better estimate of the gradient. So it's still a bit objective oriented. We still look for performance. And, and this, this exploration is still oriented towards performance. So what we want to propose is um, directed exploration using uh, goal exploration processes. So in this case, exploration would be uh, agnostic of performance. It's just like pure exploration. Um, so to do that, we need to uh, have a behavioral description. So basically, we will have a mapping between the trajectory of the agent in the environment and a behavioral space. So if we consider the same CMC example, uh, we can say that the behavior's behavior is like uh, composed of two features, so the minimum position and maximum position uh, along trajectory. So this exact trajectory will uh, fall inside the, the behavioral space. <coughs> so then we use um, the simplest uh, goal expression process we can think of, is the random goal sampling. Um, so we simply we randomly sample goal inside this behavioral space. It says the red cross here. Uh, then we we use a simple uh, inverse model to f to find the best policy to, to try to reach this goal. So we simply take the nearest neighbor. Um, so we basically take the policy that is associated to the nearest neighbor in this behavioral uh, space. So in the de deterministic um, environment, uh, it makes no sense to replay this policy because we already know uh, what is the corresponding uh, behavior. Even, I mean, in a stochastic one, we, I mean, if it's not too stochastic, we will fall in the vicinity. So in a de deterministic one or s really small, um, I mean, really small uh, stochastic one, we want to have something new. So we add some uh, noise on the on the policy, and the noise should be uh, I mean the power of the noise should be set so that we fall somehow in the in a close area uh, to this uh, to this point. So we fall here if we play uh, the new policy, the perturb policy in the environment, and we hope by doing so for many iterations we kind of um, cover the space of behavior of, of behaviors. So, yeah, the point of uh, the link with um, evolutionary strategies. So, they have, there are some evolutionary strategies that use this kind of behavioral space, like the novelty search, the map elites, or the behavioral repertoire evolution. Uh, so, I can make the points uh, that you made earlier that basically having this policy of this tactic of selecting the nearest neighbor is a bit like novelty search because in a sense if we consider um, this kind of cluster uh, it's quite obvious that this uh, cross and light uh, green in the middle will, will have uh, much less chance to be selected as the nearest neighbor of uh, a randomly drawn goal. Um, on the opposite, if we consider the, the cross uh, on the borders of this cluster, uh, so they have a more wider area of, uh, of nearest neighbors, basically. So in the end, uh, sampling a random goal and uh, taking the nearest neighbor uh, to be the policy to perturb uh, will bias uh, the choice of past policies towards uh, the one that are uh, at the borders of clusters, so the one that are uh, the most novel because the most uh, far away from their neighbors. So um, now, how do we uh, combine JEP and DDPG into uh, JEPPG? Uh, so we saw that JEP uh, was performing a pure exploration in the sense that it's irrespective of performance. Um, so although uh, uh, I forgot to mention, but 
In this, kind, in this way, we use uh, JEP irrespective of performance. We don't care about performance at all. However, we can still use JEP in an objective-oriented way. We just have to record all the performance associated to all the policies we played across learning. And when we want to test it, we simply pick the policies corresponding to the highest performance in memory. So, but in this case, uh, we don't care about performance that much. So pure exploration, we produce a diversity of trajectories. Uh, so the idea is to uh, run a few episodes of JEP at first, produce those diverse trajectories, and then uh, convert them to samples that can be directly used by the DPG. So we pre-fill basically the replay buffer of the DPG with uh, the JEP trajectories. And then we run uh, DTPG uh, as normal, so with a randomly uh, initialized uh, actor. And we exploit basically the, the, the samples uh, collected by JEP to, to follow the gradient of performance and update the policy uh, towards better policies. Um, so we tested this uh, combination against uh, so JEP and DTPG on two environments from uh, the OpenAI gym framework. So first, the, uh, the continuous mountain car that I presented earlier. So it looks like a really, really simple problem. Uh, however, um, we saw that there, is, there might be a gradient issue uh, in which, uh, I mean, the DPG could basically fail to, to solve it because of this, because of this kind of obsession towards uh, performance. So it might be interesting to, to see if this state-of-the-art uh, algorithm uh, managed to solve it. Uh, if it doesn't, uh, can JEP, so can uh, more advanced exploration help uh, solving it? And on the opposite, we have uh, the Halchita uh, environment there. Uh, so this one, on this one, the DBG is the state-of-the-art compared to other um, the deep reinforcement learning algorithms. At least it was a few months ago. I'm not sure it's still the case. Um, and it's uh, more, I mean, it has uh, higher dimensions, a higher number of dimensions. Another point, um, I'm not sure there is another point. <laughs> okay. Um, so the first thing is to see uh, whether we are right in saying that uh, JEP explores more efficiently than the DPG. So it's not really clear how it could be done uh, with half Cheetah, but with CMC it's quite clear. So to get started, the DPG would need to reach the top at least once to get uh, positive rewards in its replay buffer and to know uh, in which direction to go. Uh, so. An important thing is uh, how fast it does reach the top. Um, so we have here the histograms of the number of steps uh, required before reaching the top for the first time. For So DDPG with action perturbation, parameter perturbations, and then for two uh, variants of uh, JEP. So I stopped the simulation after 50k steps because I could have waited a really long time otherwise. Uh, so we see that uh, DTPG with action perturbations uh, performs quite poorly. Uh, it finds the top uh, early in only 22% of the cases. Um, so parameter perturbations uh, performs a bit better. So it finds the top uh, like maybe in one third of the cases uh, early. Uh, but if we compare to, to JEP, like it's, it's, uh, so JEP is much better. Uh, so I tried with a linear policy, so linear policy in the case of CMC is only two neurons. Uh, so linking the position and velocity to the next action. Uh, and we see here that it's not a matter of the complexity of the policy, because if we take the same number of neurons than uh, with uh, the DPG, uh, it's still uh, much, much faster to, to find the goal. Um, so here we see that Basically, JEP explores uh, better in, in the context of CMC. Uh, now we have to look whether it does, whether it translates uh, to better performances, basically. Um, so I'm going to guide you through this. Um, so this is the learning curve. So it's the evolution of uh, the offline 
test performance uh, cross learning. Uh, so basically, every two case steps in the environment, we test the algorithm uh, on 10 episodes. We average the return, and this is how good the, pol the current policy is. Um, so each curve is the mean and standard error of the mean across 20 different seeds. Um, so in CMC, a good policy is one that has reached the top. So it has received uh, 100 rewards and then small penalties for energy expenses. So the, a good policy is basically above uh, 90, um, 80 or 90. Uh, and a bad one is necessarily, necessarily uh, below zero because it hasn't reached the, the positive reward. So basically these curves uh, cannot really be interpreted as an average performance uh, across uh, seeds and, and runs but more of a ratio of how many uh, policy found the top, so how many good policies. So it's a slight difference. But um, So to make things a bit more clear, I plotted here basically the best performance uh, achieved across uh, learning. So it's the highest point basically uh, for each of the 20 seeds. So, um, yeah. So if we look at uh, DDPG with action perturbations, which is the canonical basically DDPG, so it's the light blue, uh, we see here that the performance stays around zero. And if we look at the best performance, like the top is reached only two times out of 20. So it's really bad. Um, so basically the performance of zero corresponds to the no movement uh, policy. So we can say that uh, the DVG did fall in the trap of the deceptive gradient and so did not explore enough to uh, get away from it. So we have here a really simple uh, environment in which uh, the state of the art algorithm uh, basically fails. Um, so when we add uh, parameter perturbations, it's a bit uh, it's a bit better than in light red. So maybe 50% of the runs uh, find the top. Um, so we saw that it, ex it did explore uh, a bit a bit more, so probably it's, it's linked. Uh, now if we look at uh, JEP alone, uh, we see surprisingly that it did, I mean it does uh, solve the task in all the time and uh, this really really early and uh, that is stable across learning. So it confirms the fact that this, uh, this environment is really uh, simple in the sense that even doing a random search in the parameter space is largely enough to, to solve it. So it's even more striking that DBG uh, cannot. Uh, now if you look at the combination of uh, JEP and DDPG, uh, so JPG. So in the first part of the curve below, uh, before the, the gray area, um, we have the JEP training, so it's not distinguishable from the green line. Uh, after that, we switch to the DPG, so it starts uh, quite low. Uh, we see that learning happens really fast, but somehow it does uh, forget about uh, the optimal policy. So this is possible because uh, DTPG only uses big network and uh, it has only one policy basically. So even if it has found uh, an optimal one, it can still update in the wrong direction and therefore uh, lose uh, this policy. In the opposite, JEP just stores uh, all the policies it has tried uh, over learning. So it cannot really forget a, a good policy. Um, so we see on the histogram, uh, however, that, I mean, even though learning is not stable, across learning, we have found uh, good policies in uh, most of the cases. So the conclusion here is that uh, the problem is so simple that it could be uh, solved by JEP. So JEP is good enough to solve it. Um, the DPG uh, does fall in the, into the trap of deceptive gradient. And uh, so we can enrich uh, the DPG with a better exploration that uh, helps to improve uh, on the DPG. Uh, however, it's not as good as JEP. So now we, s we will see in a more uh, higher dimensional uh, environments um, that JEP is not always uh, good enough to solve the task when it becomes a bit more uh, difficult. So 
uh, in green we have JEP curve, so it's the, the worst one. Um, then we have uh, DDP, the canonical DDPG that improves there. Uh, with parameter perturbations, it's uh, even better. Here we reproduce basically the results from Matthias Plappert. Um, but now if we look at the combination of JEP and DDPG, we see that uh, first there is JEP learning. Then we switch to uh, DDPG and we see that learning happens uh, really fast and uh, in the end uh, outperforms uh, DDPG. Uh, so in this case, even if there is no obvious exploration problem, I mean we, we can't see any decept obvious deceptive gradient. Um, so even in this case, uh, improving uh, DDPG with um, more advanced uh, exploration method uh, does improve on the results. So another important uh, results that we can maybe see more clearly here is that uh, the variance of final results is like much smaller than uh, so it's in dark blue and dark red than in uh, DDPG alone in light blue and light red. So this could be important uh, in robotics for instance in which we could um, hope that to have um, a good minimal performance, so for safety reasons, uh, for instance. So now a bit about uh, what I uh, want to try next. So first I want to try other environments to consolidate uh, the results. So maybe other locomotion tasks like uh, the end one. And also we will want to move on towards uh, multi-goal uh, learning. So it's the new environments in the gym framework that are the fetch environment. So it's a robotic arm that has to reach targets. So either directly with the gripper or to move uh, objects on, on the table or to make them slide. So it's by definition a multi-objective environment. So the objective can, can move in 3D. And so they build uh, insight experiment replay, which is an algorithm that is basically built on top of DDPG. Uh, that allows to solve this kind of task. And we would like to, to try to combine uh, JEP or any other uh, exploration method to uh, also this, uh, this algorithm in, in the context of this uh, environment. So it's more general. I mean, in the end, we could, we could think of other exploration methods. It could be MapElite, it could be novelty search, JEP, uh, or whatever. And we could in the end, combine it with uh, many more uh, reinforcement learning algorithm. It could be Insight Experience Replay, DDPG, could be A3C or Ector, for instance. So it's not limited to what I presented today. Um, then we would like to try uh, alternative approaches to combine uh, the exploration and the exploitation parts. Uh, so for instance, for now, we just transfer the, the samples towards the memory buffer. But we could think of uh, using ideas from uh, imitation learning. So for instance, there is uh, policy distillation. So we learn uh, DDPG's actor in a supervised manner uh, from samples coming from JEP actors. So we feed observations to JEP, we translate them uh, given the controller into actions, and we have couples of observations actions. And then we use those samples to, to train uh, directly the DPG actor, to bootstrap uh, directly the, the network. Uh, another idea that is quite recent is to use uh, two objectives in the learning of uh, the DPG. So first, it would be uh, the, the canonical uh, reinforcement learning uh, performance, so the objective of performance. And second, the cross entropy uh, between uh, JEP and DDPG. So it's like JEP is the teacher in the uh, imitation learning framework and DDPG is the student. And so the weight between the two uh, objectives could be uh, adapted to cross learning so that at first uh, DDPG tries to copy, to mimic a bit uh, JEP um, so actions uh, with still some sense of uh, wh where is the, the performance, where is the goal to be found. And after a while, when it gets uh, better than JEP, it just uh, forgets about it and just takes care about, uh, takes care of uh, the reinforcement learning uh, performance. 
So finally, um, we'd like to find uh, predictors of uh, JPG performance. So what are the features of a buffer that makes it a good buffer for the JPG to learn uh, from? So is it the best policy found by uh, the JEP? Uh, is it the overall quality of uh, those policies? Or is it really the exploration uh, quality? And if so, how could we really measure this quality? It is, uh, is it the diversity of behaviors in the behavioral space we have defined? Uh, is it the entropy of the state action distributions? Um, I don't know if, we have, if you had any more ideas, uh, I'll be <coughs> glad to, to discuss that. Uh, that's it for me. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Any question? Um, on the very last slide, you talked about the, how to define the goal space, uh, <coughs> what kind of exploration measures, and so on. Uh, well, do you have an idea on how to automate? The definition of no space, like uh, taking an episode and say uh, find a, find a metric, a metric that would be interesting to measure in this episode, and then try to reproduce this, the results we obtain in the episode. Uh, like well, instead of defining uh, engineering uh, exploration me measures, try to uh, automate the process of defining them. Um. Yes, so that's the work of Adrien um, that tries to uh, basically learn either online or before by observations um, a goal space. So instead of having to define it, which cannot, which can sometimes be a bit of a mess. you would have a tool and a toy. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say if you explore a lot with JEP, you will find a lot of movements of your hands that do not grab the toy, the tool. Mm -hmm. And you will find a lot of movements of the tool that do not grab the, grab the toy. Mm -hmm. Do you think all those trajectory and points even though, uh, from my perspective, they are useless. To, to could be used for... They could be used, and they could be actually useful for the second part for the DPG. Uh, I could see the directions why it's not good to go. Yeah, it's difficult to say. I mean, it's part of this point where we'd like to understand what is required inside the replay buffer for the DPG to, to, to kick off. Um, but in the end, it's still interesting because, um, I mean, the DPG usually uh, fills its replay buffer at first with, um, I mean, it's initialized with a random policy. So around zero, basically. So at first, it does not do much. So all those uh, samples of not doing much uh, could be replaced by uh, your sample. Or uh, maybe sometimes it doesn't touch the, the tool. but. But it does sometimes, and with a random policy, a randomly uh, initialized policy, it most of the time doesn't touch anything. So it could still help to bootstrap it, I guess. Actually, Sebastian, in your experiment, when you, if you use the um, surrogate inverse model with regression, yeah. it, uh, it it those points are also probably useful. It needs to be checked, but probably. Uh, yeah. And so here it should be useful equally for the same reason, I guess. Mm. And maybe um, future work that you did not describe and uh, that we considered that might be of interest to dream people that in this work we are using JEP for, for, for a time and then using DDPG. Mm -hmm. And it might be interesting to rather select between using JEP and DDPG a long, a long time. Uh, and this could be seen as kind of different developmental waves where you first explore a lot and you exploit more and more. Uh, okay, and we could consider doing, doing this just with a multi arm bandit that selects either using JEP or either using DPG long time. I, I, okay, yep. so they don't have time to do everything, but this is something yeah. we consider that might be of interest in this context.
Um, but we would require also like a measure of exploration of performance, I mean a measure on which to do the multi-arm bandit, uh, which is what we like for, for now. In the case of Hype Cheetah, you did not describe exactly what is the behavior space or oh yeah, the goals, the yeah, yeah. information you need yeah. to work at the end. Uh, so I've tried several things, but in the end I use uh, the minimal um, head position across the trajectory and the average uh, velocity. So it's like trying to characterize what is a good trajectory, but it's still like putting a lot of like engineering in, in, into it. Uh, no, I, I mean, I just take the policy of the nearest neighbor, so it's, and I mean, the simplest, this is the simplest invest model. You mentioned uh, inside experience replay. Yeah. Do you have plans to study a bit in detail the link between this and GEP or? Yeah, I'm currently doing this. Uh, so on the fetch environment, on this one. So I've achieved like some um, results with Jeb, so it doesn't, it's not as good as uh, her in the end, but still uh, learns a bit faster at first. So... Um, Yeah, so far, like that's the first thing I'm, I'm doing. But yeah, I'm just at the beginning, uh, but uh, yeah, it's clearly closely related to to what Jeb is doing. Uh, that also may be why Jeb couldn't uh, like bring something more, like much more new. Actually, um, from the point of view of the formalization that uh, Sebastian presented, uh, Insight Experience Library is also a form of uh, of Jeb. Mm -hmm. uh, the difference is that uh, the implementation uh, of the Jeb process in the experiment that Cédric and Sebastian presented is made um, with an architecture which is actually um, uh, learning uh, by uh, storing a population of controllers, uh, whereas in the Insight Experience replay, uh, the, the learning is, is made by updating a single large controller. But, uh, but actually, it's a I would say it's a difference in implementation but what they share in common is the fundamental idea of the JEP, that uh, there is uh, a space of goals uh, which is sampled from and which is used uh, in, a, um, uh, in a process where you use optimization and reinforcement learning which is parameterized by the goal. And, which, and the, the whole efficiency, well, from the, from the point of view of um, efficiency, the, the central point and, uh, of the JEP and common point between those, those approaches is the fact that when you do a JEP, when you set up a goal, uh, you use your current knowledge to try a policy to reach that goal, and even if you don't <coughs> progress toward that goal, but you have a high probability to produce another effect, which then can be used to improve the, no the knowledge toward another goal, so typically mm -hmm. reaching this other effect. So it's like the, like you want to, the goal is maybe you want to push uh, uh, an object to the right, you do uh, the best movement you think to move the object to the right, and actually you move it to the left. So you didn't learn how to move it to the right, but you learn how to move it on the left. Yeah, um, I'm completely okay with that. But uh, I don't know the inside experience to play paper enough, but do they explicitly look for, go for goals and diversity of goals? Because you could make no, them through their learning. Not really. No, no, actually, in, in what they do, it's a, it's a, it's a, ran it's a random goal policy. So like, like yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, it's seen a bit differently because it's like the environment is giving the goal, and not. Yeah, but it's. Like I mean, it, it could be changed, of course, but that's not. Like yeah. In the, uh, in, in the way they program their benchmark, it's the environment who provides the goal, but it's just like having the agent who chooses mm -hmm. a random new goal. Yeah. But then, obviously, what can be done, and I think Pierre is, has been looking a little bit at this, uh, is how to select the goal not randomly but using uh, 
measure such as learning progress or other kinds like measuring diversity uh, effects? I mean, like there are many ways that can be explored. Uh, but yes, a very interesting and open issue is what, to understand really in detail what are the advantages and uh, drawbacks of uh, implementing JEPs with a population of controllers in a memory-based manner, as opposed, and which are mostly simple controllers, as opposed to a single big neural network controller. Uh, yeah, I think it's an interesting question to, to understand advantages and drawbacks. Another difference that I not, that have not been pointed to yet in the discussion is that uh, once you have selected your goal and you want to improve your policy towards this goal, in JEPs this will be done but just by random exploration around this goal, whereas in DDP in, in, uh, inside experience replay, this will be done by stochastic, stochastic gradient descent uh, with respect to your critique. Uh, and if you have a deceptive gradient issue, this won't work. But if you have a narrow gradient issue, probably this will work better than using uh, random exploration. So there might be environments uh, from which one method or the other one might be better. And yes, Pierre will tell you things about this. So one last thing. I mean, wanna, can you go back to the continuous mountain car current? When Mathieu wanted to compare his algorithms and DDPG to uh, genetic algorithms like, like CMA, uh, CMAES, uh, in order to have a fair comparison, I think that uh, another type of curve is not the actual performance like, like you did this, mm -hmm. but to um, also remember the max of your past uh, uh, policies from DDPG. Oui, that's that's basically this. I mean, this is uh, taking the highest point in the curve and uh, like like playing it, I don't know, one at a time. Yep. Instead of um, starting from scratch with DDPG, why don't you learn a policy from the buffer that you get from Jeff? So you mean... Policy distillation, basically, or? No, but here it's uh, yeah. yeah, here, why? why uh, because, uh, like, this actor network is uh, randomly initialized, so it's, like, from scratch. But that's why, uh, that's because, uh, basically, here we use uh, another type of policy. This is a linear policy, in this case. Uh, yeah, but you have the sample, and with the sample, you could learn the weight of the network. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what we are considering. Like, it's I think it's called policy distillation, and yeah, we are planning on trying this. Yeah. 